to consider uh, uh, the fact that we are not citizens of this world. Uh, our citizenship is in heaven above. The place that we are living is foreign to us. And so we ought to be as foreign to the world as it is to us. They ought to take note of us and note our accent. You saw our First Lady give a speech, and some took note of her accent. Uh, it's right, proper, and fitting for somebody not to be of this place to speak a little differently. Even if they do learn our language, they're going to come across with mannerisms or customs, perhaps, if you're in their home. They're going to act and behave a little differently. And it's intriguing. I don't know about you, but whenever I, I visit another church, and if the pastor is an international, and they're coming from a different country, just their accent alone amazes me, and I'm mesmerized during the sermon. Now, I should slip into my New England accent a little more often, perhaps to keep you all awake, so you can laugh and chuckle at my <clears throat> diction. But... The truth is, I am not of this region, but I am not of this world either. I am an alien in a foreign land. Our passage this morning, thank you for reading that uh, this morning, Paul. <clears throat> Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Neither are his followers. We who follow Christ are not of this world, just as he is not of this world. And even though he made this world, this world will be destroyed. There is a kingdom that is to come, and that is his kingdom. Um, Jesus also told us, uh, told the Father in prayer, in the high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 16, they, meaning the disciples or all Christians, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world, he reminds the Father. We are not of this place that we call home. There are a number of things that I would like to share with you on the topic, and perhaps we'll revisit this passage of Scripture again, but I thought it, it best to take a look at uh, the early church and what they were known for and how they were behaving. And we have a number of documents that come down to us uh, from church history. Uh, again, these are not from Scripture, but they're interesting to note. For instance, uh, we have this uh, Aristides letter to the Emperor Hadrian, and it's probably written between uh, 117 and 138 AD. He's speaking of Christians. He's telling uh, the emperor, the king, uh, about Christianity. And this is what he has to say. Every morning and all hours, on account of the goodness of God toward them, they render praise and laud him over their food and their drink. They render him thanks. And if any righteous person of their number passes away from this world, they rejoice and give thanks to God. And they follow his body as though he were moving from one place to another. And when a child is born to them, they praise God. And and if, again, it chances to die in its infancy, they praise God mightily, as if one who has passed through the world without sins. Wow. This is the report that comes to this, the king, of these strange people who are living among them. And it's not a bad report. Not a bad report at all. Uh, he went on to say, they abstain from all impurity in the hope of the recompense that is to come in another world. As for their servants or handmaidens or children, they persuade them to become Christians and by the love that they have for them. And when they become so, they call them without distinction brothers. They do not worship strange gods and they walk in all humility and kindness, and falsehood is not found among them, and they love one another. When they see the stranger, they bring him into their homes and rejoice over him as over a true brother. But they do not call those who are after the flesh 
but those who are in the Spirit and in God. Well, some good words uh, to the king. He was able to learn a little bit about this cult that was started up, spreading. Uh, this, again, would be the second century, early in the second century, where Christians are starting to take hold in Greece and in the Roman world. It's, it's spreading, and such, such leaders are hearing reports. And you would think that they would be happy to have such kind, generous, loving people in their midst. And for the most part, they were. Christians had a very good reputation. Um, but they were easy scapegoats because they tended not to fight back. And you could blame things on them and make accusations against them. And everyone seemed to um, be willing to do so and allow that to happen because somehow Christians were showing them up. They were living above the world on a different plane. And they didn't like that. Have you ever been in a workplace where everyone seems to not do their best? And maybe you just started working there. And so you are trying to, to do over and above. You're showing up early. You're leaving late. And you do your work efficiently and quickly. And everyone's saying, slow down, slow down. We got all day. You're making us look bad. Have you ever heard that? You're making us look bad. It ought to be the most frequent accusation against the Christian. It ought to be. Not that I'm making you look bad. Why don't you work as hard as me? No. You're making us look bad. Slow down. Take it easy. It ought to be said of Christians. I think it was in the first, second, third centuries of the early church. And that's what some of these writings uh, remind us of, of what the church was facing and and what they were going through and how they were living. Uh, Dio, uh, Dionetus in 130 AD wrote these words. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. As citizens, they share in all things with others, and yet endure all things as if foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their own native country, and every land that is their birth as a land of strangers. They marry, as do all others. They get children, but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days in earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. Kind of fascinating. If you're hearing these words, you're thinking that this is a super blessing to any culture, to any group of people. As I explained, not always so were they received. He also said, uh, Christians likewise love those who hate them. Christians are confined in the world as in a prison, and yet they are the preservers of the world. You know, Jesus taught the disciples that they were the salt of the earth, the preservers of the earth, and they were living that way, trying to help others and preserve life and be of assistance to all, and as far as it depended upon them, they were trying to live peaceably with all. This was the character of the early church because of the word of God, because of the difference Christ makes when he takes up residence. When one becomes a Christian, one lives differently because instantly we are citizens of another realm. God's realm, heaven is our home. That's our destination. We live not for the, this king of this world, but we live for the king of heaven, the king over all. We will be going to heaven. And we will be answerable to him. We will be judged by him. So we live according to his standards, not the world's standards. We live very differently. There's another source. Tertullian is his name. He was an early church scholar. He lived in North Africa, 
late in the second century and part early part of the third century. He's writing of his, the fellowship, the Christian fellowship, his church. And he says, we assemble to read our sacred writings and with the sacred words we nourish our faith. We animate our hope. We make our confidence more steadfast and no less by the incalculations of God's precepts we confirm good habits. They build each other up in the early church. They do a, a mighty work. He goes on to say, though we have our treasure chest, it is not made up of purchased money, as the religion that is that has its price. In other words, the offerings, the monies that come into the church are not um, ex exacted from people. Um, it's not a tax. You don't have to pay in order to be part of the fellowship, is what he's saying there. On a monthly day, if he likes, each puts in a small donation, but only if it is his pleasure, and only if he is able. For there is no compulsion. It is voluntary. These gifts are not spent on feasts and drinking bouts and eating houses, perhaps restaurants, um, but to support and bury poor people. To supply the wants of boys and girls destitute of means and parents and of old persons confined now to the, to the house. Such too as have suffered shipwreck and if any, and if there happen to be any in the same minds banished to the islands or shut up in the prisons for nothing but their fidelity to the cause of God's church, they become nurslings of their confession. He's basically sharing what they did with this money. It wasn't spent on themselves. It wasn't spent on their organization or their buildings. At this point, they didn't even have church buildings. There were no churches, as we know structures. Churches were groups of people who met in homes, who met by rivers, who met in fields and under trees. This is where the church would gather. And they would do so frequently, and they uplifted and encouraged one another, and they provided for anyone who had a need, not just in their community, but even outside of the community. Imagine, if you will, a system that doesn't have a welfare, a government that doesn't have a, a welfare system, doesn't have social security. The prisons are run by military, and meals don't show up at these prisons. Those people starve to death unless someone from outside the prison goes to the prison with food for them. This was the case in the first, second, and third centuries. This is how people were living, and the church met tangible needs time and time again. There weren't foster care systems. There was no Department of Family Services who investigated abuses. Children would be sacrificed in the name of their God. This is the type of, of world that they were living in. There was a starker contrast uh, to the Christian and the world that they were living in in these centuries that I'm talking about than in our century that we are living in now. Christian culture, the way we live, has had its influence. And we now have systems that are run by the government, not the church. And they are a Judeo-Christian ethic, if you will. And our society has changed for the better. And we are acting more like Christians, except our government is supposed to be secular. Right? When these programs were set up, we were still a Christian nation, but we have become something different over the years. Even though the institutions were put in place by Christians and motivated by Christian thought and morality, we have those institutions still in place, but without Christ at the center. I was reading earlychurch.com they made some astute observations of the early church. The first Christians 
lived under a completely different set of principles and values than the rest of mankind. They rejected the world's entertainment, honors, and riches. They were already citizens of another kingdom and listened to the voice of a different master. This was true of the second century church as it was the first. When a devastating plague swept across the ancient world in the third century, Christians were the ones who cared for the sick, which they did at the risk of contracting the plague themselves. Meanwhile, pagans were throwing infected members of their own family into the streets even before they died in order to protect themselves from the disease. Stark, stark contrast there. Here, the practice was to care more about yourself than your own family, and the Christians are caring for strangers as if they were family and treating them even better than those around them would treat their own family. That's what was going on back then. There's another um, Christian from the second century, Justin Martyr. We have these uh, words left over from him. We who used to value the acquisition of wealth and possessions more than anything else now bring what we have into common fun and share it with anyone who needs it. We used to hate and destroy one another and refuse to associate with people of another race or country. But now, because of Christ, we live together with such people and pray for our enemies. Very, very different. Uh, than the world that they were living in. Um, and there's certainly a lot of in this uh, about racism as well. Rodney Stark wrote a, a book. He's, he's a scholar out of Princeton. Um, the Rise of Christianity, uh, 1996. He penned these words. Christianity served as a re revitalization movement that arose in response to the misery, chaos, fear, and brutality of life in the urban Greco-Roman world. It did this by providing new norms and new kinds of social relationships able to cope with many urgent problems. To cities filled with homeless and impoverished, Christianity offered charity as well as hope. To cities filled with newcomers and strangers, Christianity offered an immediate basis for attachment. Cities filled with orphans and widows, Christianity provided a new and expanded sense of family. To cities torn by violent ethnic strife, Christianity offered a new basis for social solidarity. And to cities faced with epidemics, fires, and earthquakes, Christianity offered effective nursing services. For what they brought was not simply an urban movement, but a new culture capable of making life in the Greco-Roman cities more tolerable. They were, they were an incredible force among them. You were fortunate if you had Christians living in your community, if there was a church in your town. You were fortunate. They didn't even know what they had. It was all new to them. But as Christians started to live, their character became known, and the quality of their witness went out there. People were intrigued by this group of people calling themselves Christians. And they, the faith continued to grow as more people adopted the faith and took on such a lifestyle, transformed by God and his indwelling spirit, as well as by the word of God, the teachings of Jesus Christ, who taught us to be loving and compassionate to be giving and caring for others, to care about others and treat them as more important than ourselves. We live in a post-Christian society today where the U.S. is no longer just a Christian nation. During revivals, bars, liquor stores, jails uh, were closing and our society refused to even think of sin. But now, divorce, abortion, pornography, homosexuality, rioting, gambling, euthanasia abound. But can Christians revive a residue of godly character 
in our culture today? Can we stand in contrast to the world around us? What are people reporting to authorities about us today as Christians? Do they feel fortunate to have a Christian living next door to them? Do they feel fortunate that they live right down the street from a church? What are they saying about us? Well, they may not be saying much at all to our shame. Let me read uh, this passage again from Philippians uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 20. Starting in verse 20, not the whole uh, section that Paul read for us. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enabled him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. When I think of that transformation, it's not just the body that will go through transformation. You know, when we are transformed, when we are um, ascending into glory and we're given our eternal bodies, yes, there'll be that physical transformation, but there's also a transformation that happens our whole life long as Christians. It's called sanctification. It's that cutting away of everything that's of the world and evil and bad and wicked about us. Our sinful nature being put aside and a new nature being clothed with power from on high and living more and more like Jesus, becoming like him in this life. Not entirely, not yet, but slowly and gradually ourselves transforming. And as we transform, we have the opportunity to affect transformation in the community around us, our neighborhoods, our homes, our families. We are the salt of the earth. We are the preservers. Because we exist in this country, this country is blessed like no other. But if we are on the decline in a post-Christian culture, if Christians are named less and less, and we're letting the state take over all the, the good doing all the things that we used to do, we're not transforming, we're not preserving the culture anymore. And the fear is that Christianity will lose its reputation, its witness, that we would lose our standing before the Lord, that our lampstand would be removed, that fewer and fewer would be joining us until eventually we are a post-Christian country. And Christians cannot be found here. And missionaries are sent here. I was reminded yesterday when Dan Nichols came to speak to the deacons that the United States is the third largest mission field in the world. Now that might surprise many of you, but it's true. When you add up all the non-Christians and even those who have never heard of Jesus, we rank third in the world behind China and India. And other countries are sending Christian, Christian missionaries to our country. Are you aware of that? That's what they think of us today. And yet there should be enough Christians still in our country to affect the change and make a difference. But we're not because we're acting like the world instead of citizens of another world. We've gotten a little too comfortable. I don't think I read that. Let us not be known for what we stand against, but for acts and deeds of kindness. Let us love all and be positive and uplifting. Let us live up to our calling of being the salt and light of the world. Let us confirm good habits and repent from sinful ones. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to consider your words this morning. The whole idea that we are not of this world, well, it's, it sounds strange because we are of this world. I was born in Framingham, Massachusetts, and each one has a birth 
certificate and, and we were born to our homes and our families and we were brought up in this community or that and we went to that school and we were trained for this or that. We got a job down the street there, our very first job, and we're working now in this community. Father, there's, there's so many ways that, that we claim citizenship of this world. And yet, Father, the truth is for the Christian that we are not of this world. Father, I think that that is being lost, that Christians increasingly embrace this world. It's easier to do than the first century Christians. They stood in stark contrast. Today, Father, the rest of the world almost looks Christian to us, as if there's no need to have Christians act uh, so differently. We don't stand out like we once did. But Father, that does not excuse us from your commandments. They're not suggestions. We should be in stark contrast, for without uh, the Spirit, the world cannot live truly a Christian character. They cannot be God. They have to know you. Father, I pray that if there's somebody here this morning that is not trusting in Jesus, somebody who's not a Christian, that they would see their need for a Savior and would turn to you now in prayer, confessing their sins and embracing Jesus who died on the cross for their sins, that they would join us in this cause of transforming our world for your honor and glory. If it's your need while we're still in an attitude of prayer, won't you pray this prayer if it's your need? Father God, I am a sinner. And I need forgiveness. I trust that Jesus died for me to pay the penalty of my sins. And my sins are many. I am wicked and I need forgiveness. I repent. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Make me a new creature. I want to be your child. And I want to live differently. I want to have an impact. I want to make a difference. From this day forward, I am yours. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.